food sold at McDonald's. Quite often you would have complaints, people saying their hamburger was cold or sometimes raw meat. Would you like to comment on that? To my knowledge, raw meat was never knowingly served to customers. I'm going to go through what I would call lies. Well, I'm going to intervene now, partly because Mr. Morris has started playing to the gallery. Cancer. McLibel. McTorture. McDonald's. McLibel. McRipoff. We begin tonight's reconstruction of the McLibel trial with what was to become the longest trial in English legal history now well into its second year. McDonald's was suing two anarchists from London Greenpeace, Helen Steele and Dave Morris, for libel over this leaflet. London Greenpeace should not, of course, be confused with Greenpeace International. Last night, we saw how witnesses on both sides dealt with claims made in the leaflet that McDonald's tortured animals reared for slaughter, exploited children by advertising, and sold food which bore the risk of causing heart disease and cancer. In tonight's programme, the court hears evidence about claims in the leaflet that McDonald's exploit their staff, that people who've eaten at McDonald's have suffered from food poisoning, and that McDonald's are responsible for the destruction of rainforests in order to raise beef for hamburgers. Because there's no legal aid in libel cases, Steele and Morris conduct their own defence in court. McDonald's are represented by one of the country's leading libel barristers, Richard Rampton QC. The judge, presiding over his first libel trial, is Mr Justice Bell. In the witness box, the man who is proud to be called Mr Big Mac in Britain, President of McDonald's UK, Mr Paul Preston. We pass on to another section of the pamphlet, uh, which has to do with the way in which McDonald's is alleged to treat its workers. What's it like working for McDonald's? It says, workers in catering do badly in terms of pay and conditions. They are at work in the evenings and at weekends, doing long shifts in hot, smelly, noisy environments. Wages are low and chances of promotion minimal. Can I ask you to comment on the level of wages? Well, it says, wages are low. That demands comparison. Low compared to what? What about the assertion that chances of promotion in McDonald's are minimal? Absolute rubbish. Probably half our management people in the UK started as members of staff. I figure the number is probably higher in the United States where we've been trading so much longer. The most powerful member of McDonald's Corporation, the parent company in America, to give evidence at this trial was Senior Vice President Robert McKinley Beavers. My first contact with McDonald's was 1963. I was a college student and started off as a part-time employee at a dollar an hour. Although you started off at the minimum wage, you were rapidly promoted. I'd like to ask how you found the working environment. I found it challenging, exciting. It was, in my view, good preparation for a lot of responsibilities that I had later on. The store environment was an integrated one, and it was quite a learning experience for me. By that, do you mean it was racially integrated, or do you mean in uh, human terms? Racially integrated. Now, I'd like you to look at the pamphlet in front of you and turn to the fifth page. Um, the truth is, McDonald's are only interested in recruiting cheap labour, which always means that disadvantaged groups Women, and black people especially, are even more exploited by industry than they are already. As far as that concerns McDonald's, is that true or false? That is false. Mr Rampton has set you up on a pedestal as someone who is black and has risen up the ranks of McDonald's as a shining example. Are you happy to take that mantle? I guess I wouldn't characterize my situation as being unique. There are a number of people of color that have had an opportunity to start off at the minimum wage, work through the ranks, and now hold responsible positions throughout the McDonald's system. Well, we've established McDonald's employs a great deal of black people and women. I mean, to put it in layperson's terms, I'm not being silly. Isn't the tendency that the shit work in society is done by disadvantaged groups? Malad. Could I ask what that means? I know what it means. Well, I don't. Well, I know pretty well what it means. 
What I'm saying is people can have different views. Obviously, someone who doesn't support the capitalist system, for example, may say that it's a reasonable statement to make that McDonald's are recruiting cheap labour. Uh, well, no, the, uh, the statement in the, the leaflet says uh, the, the truth is McDonald's are only, that's my emphasis, so that you can see the word, interested in recruiting cheap labour. Well, leaving aside the only then, would you say McDonald's are interested in recruiting cheap labour? No. We try to recruit the very best people we can at competitive wages that are consistent with what the market will bear. Without asking about your own individual salary, would you say it was fair to say that the salaries of directors and officers such as yourself or somewhere between three quarters of a million and two million dollars a year. No, Alain, I'm going to object now. No, no, no. <coughs> I, I listen carefully to, carefully, to any evidence that's called to compare McDonald's hourly rate with that of other industries, but for, but for people doing comparable work and judging whether the pay is low. I, I can't see that the, uh, the remuneration of executives has any relevance to the question of whether crew members receive low pay in the context of what's written in this, uh, this leaflet. Now, that is a ruling. Uh, which I now make so that it's understood throughout the rest of the evidence. Do you think your wages are high? No, I'm sorry. I made very clear my ruling. Concentrate, if you will, on the pay of crew members, which is what the leaflet's all about. Yeah, and it's about low wages compared to the high wages. heard wage. my ruling. If I may say so, I think you've just made a judgement based on politics rather than... No. A... Because it's a matter of opinion what you're comparing something with. We're entitled to compare low wages with the high wages of executives. You've heard my ruling. I didn't realise you were going to make a ruling. I'm certainly not making any political judgments in this case. Yeah, but I didn't actually realise you were going to make a ruling and we weren't going to get an opportunity to present a full uh, argument on abide, it. Abide by it, nevertheless. The defendants argued that not only were McDonald's employees low paid, they were also encouraged to hustle or work as fast as possible, which could put health and safety at risk. Just to save time, Hustle is something that has emanated from McDonald's in the United States, the hustle policy, yeah? Yes, it has its roots in our early days. Are you aware that the hustle policy has been condemned by the health and safety executive in the UK? I am not aware of that, no. Well, that's the report that you have in front of you. It says in the top paragraph, the example of how hustle was interpreted demonstrates that health and safety were considered as secondary in the provision of quality service. You know, I can't imagine my partners here in the UK normally want to violate any regulation or laws. I think the philosophy of having our employees work with purpose and dispatch is a good one. Doesn't mean compromising their safety or welfare. You have competitions at McDonald's. You encourage competition between crew members for who can make the most money, who can do that the fastest, who can do this the fastest, don't you? Competition for a job, well done. The reality is, the spirit of competition and the urge to increase speed is creating unsafe conditions for the staff, is it not? No, it is and greater profits for the employer. No, it isn't. Do you remember the first National Hamburger Olympics around uh, 1972, set up by McDonald's in Las Vegas? Yes. That was for McDonald's workers to compete in the stuffing of French fries, and pouring of Coke, and flipping of hamburgers, yeah? Yes, And sir. get prizes. Yes. And that was employees from all over the United States in that competition. We had regional competitions. The best were selected and participated in the trip. Those that made the final, they went to a banquet. There, in front of their families, they received recognition and rewards. As an anecdote... And how important was it to work fast? Well, it was much more than that. I was about to say as an anecdote. There was one gentleman who worked in the organization, a 17-year-old kid who was very timid. You know, if you went up to speak with him, he would, you know, collapse. He really engaged himself in this all-American competition. 
He was the best of the best in his production area at his restaurant. He won the competition for the New York region. Yeah, well, was this... Uh, Let me finish. Just say what the beneficial effect on him was, Mr. Beavers. I am just trying to compose myself. You see, I am still a bit touched by... Very well, very well. Just take a pause. No, well, I was just going to say that his parents felt that. Just a minute. Don't worry. This individual did quite well. He felt, you know, he was able to demonstrate to all that he was the best there was in the production area. His parents broke down and cried at the banquet. He went on to become a store manager, an area supervisor, and up till recently, a franchisee, owner of three stores. He has been able to buy his parents a home and provide for his family in a fashion he could not otherwise have dreamed of. Yeah, well, let's not talk about one individual. The fact is there are always going to be more people who don't get to the top, aren't there, than the ones that do make the top? That is the nature of life. Not everybody gets to be vice president. Not everybody gets to be president. At this point in the trial, Sid Nicholson moved from his customary seat in court to make his first appearance in the witness box and to give evidence on employment matters in Britain. Formerly head of personnel at McDonald's UK from 1984 to 1991, Nicholson is now a vice president and the company ombudsman. Before joining McDonald's, he'd been a policeman for 31 years, first serving with the Bechuanaland Protectorate Police and later working his way through the ranks of the Metropolitan Police Force to become a chief superintendent. To what extent, if any, was your experience in the police force of use to you when you became at McDonald's head of personnel? In some ways, extremely helpful, uh, welfare particularly. Of what? Welfare particularly. Suppose it was suggested that, in effect, McDonald's is a sweatshop which exploits the young and the disadvantaged for its own profit. What comment would you have about that general proposition? I would reject it out of hand. Is that simply because you are a McDonald's person in a senior position giving evidence here in court? No. Uh, my experience of organisations dictates to me that McDonald's is an extremely caring organisation. During cross-examination, a film about McDonald's produced for Channel 4 called One Every Mile was shown in court and Sid Nicholson was asked to comment on it. During the film, staff members attended a consultation meeting run by a supervisor, known at McDonald's as a rap session. They make a lot of money, but the pay's not good. The subjects covered and the views expressed during that rap session, were they fairly typical? Yes. So it's typical when the staff were asked, is there one thing you can do to improve the company, and they said pay, that would be fairly typical, would it? It would be one of the subjects that often came up. It is not typical. It is not always pay, but pay is often mentioned. Is it typical? You show me any working man who feels he's getting enough pay. Especially on the minimum wage? I don't feel I'm getting enough pay. Mr Nicholson, could you tell us what you think trade unions are for, what their role is in society? Negotiate wages, conditions of service, involve themselves in politics, support the Labour Party. And provide information to their members about their rights. Do they do that? I would accept that in some cases they probably do. I don't really know a great deal about trade unions. If someone amongst the crew was a member of a union, or wished to be a member of a union, they wouldn't be allowed to inform the union about conditions inside the stores. I don't see how we could stop that. Unless, of course, we found out about it. If you found out about it, sorry, informing outside organisations about in-store conditions is gross misconduct. That's right. A summary, sackable offence. It is. During the year from April 1995 to March 1996, more than 70 witnesses followed Sid Nicholson into the witness box to give evidence on McDonald's attitude to unions and employment practices. 
Stan Stein, McDonald's senior vice president in charge of human resources, spent 10 days in the witness box, being examined and cross-examined about labor relations worldwide. It was McDonald's case that no witnesses had given evidence of dismissals due to union sympathies or activities, that in Britain and America there had never been any great demand for union recognition, and that in some countries McDonald's restaurants were unionized. And it was while Stan Stein was still in the witness box in June 1995 that McDonald's revealed to the press that a second attempt had been made to settle the case out of court. McDonald's flew a team over from America again. They met with Helen Steele and Dave Morris, who told them their conditions. McDonald's must undertake not to sue anyone for making similar criticisms again, apologize to those they've sued in the past, and pay a substantial sum to a third party in lieu of the defendant's costs. Not surprisingly, McDonald's rejected those conditions, and the hearing continued. Now, crew members from stores throughout the country were called to give evidence about working for McDonald's. Tonight, we focus on witnesses from the High Street store in Colchester, which was elected Store of the Year in 1987. This is Mark Davis, Colchester manager at that time, and now a McDonald's operations manager, responsible for 35 restaurants. As you probably know, the defendants have said that they will call as witnesses some of the people who worked at Colchester during your time as manager. I want you to tell us if you can remember any of them. Um, uh, Mr. Simon Gibney? Yes. A lady called Kate Harrison? Yes. And a gentleman called Siamak Alimi? Yes. Do you see any of those people in court? Yes. Which? Siamak. Which is he, so we can know for the future. He's the gentleman with the checked blue and white shirt on. Then, Mr. Davis, labour costs. An allegation made in this case is that the company exerts pressure on its managers to keep their labour costs to a fixed figure. I think the figure of 15% is proposed by the defendants. What comment do you have about that? The company never stipulated an exact labour percent to keep in line with. It was very much left to the local manager, in conjunction with the supervisor, to schedule to need rather than a fixed labour percent. What would be the consequence, do you think, if you were chronically understaffed so that your crew were bad-tempered, tired and grumpy? The customers would not come back longer term. Have you, in all your experience at McDonald's, ever come across a manager who was aiming rather at saving money than having the right number of crew for the right number of customers? No. Never? No. The court heard a rather different story when Simon Gibney gave evidence for the defendants. Gibney joined McDonald's at the age of 16, was promoted to shift manager at 18, then left after refusing a move to Milton Keynes. Dave Morris asked him about parts of his witness statement. Well, this is section three. For a period of three months, I was responsible for the staff schedule. This was calculated by looking at the day's projected takings. The total hours used was always below the allowed labour rate of 15%. Is that a true and accurate reflection of your experience? Yes. The Colchester store was set specific targets by the area supervisor, a man called Frank Stanton. In order to improve the yield performance of the store, he instructed the manager, Mark Davis, to water down drink syrups, ketchup, mustard, milkshake mix, cut the cheese slices into two pieces, one roughly half the size of the other, and to use the larger piece in the cheeseburger, which should have had a whole slice, and the smaller piece in a fillet of fish, which should have had half a slice. Make the staff squeeze the fry cartons when filling them and so on. Is all that correct from your experience? Yes. But Simon Gibney's allegations, reported to the press next day, were denied by Mark Davis. Some allegations of dishonesty have been made against you. That you and Mr Stanton conspired to water down syrups, mustard, ketchup, etc, etc, etc. Definitely not. Can you think of any advantage you might have obtained from doing that on a scale which was at, as it were, but to confer a commercial benefit? It, it wouldn't confer any commercial benefit because whatever product you consider, watering down of anything, say, mix or syrups, would cause the customers to bring them back almost immediately. I see no benefit whatsoever to that practice. And Gibney's accusation was also denied by Frank Stanton when he was questioned by Tim Atkinson, Mr Rampton's junior counsel. When you were area supervisor at Colchester in the mid-1980s, 
Did you ever give instruction to the store manager, Mark Davis, to water down the drinks that were served to customers? I did not. Did you do that in relation to syrups? No. Ketchup? No. Mustard? No. Milkshake mix? No. Are you aware of that going on at Colchester? No. Would you have tolerated anyone doing that? I would not have tolerated it. Did you give any instruction to Mark Davis or anyone else to use less cheese in the burgers? No. Were you aware of that practice going on at Colchester? I was not. Would you have tolerated it? Absolutely not. What did customers think about the quality of food sold at McDonald's? Sometimes, or quite often, you would have complaints. People saying their hamburger was cold, or sometimes raw meat. People would come back, especially with quarter pounders. Because for quarter pounders to sear, you needed a lot of brute force to physically press the burger down on the grill plate to make it cook through before you turned it. And if you didn't have the strength, then the meat wouldn't be properly cooked. What was the procedure to deal with that complaint? Give a replacement. Right. Did you ever fill in any forms? No. No, I wasn't aware of any form there was to be filled in for that kind of thing. As we showed in last night's programme, this allegation of undercooking was a serious one, since cooking to the correct temperature is acknowledged by both sides to be crucial in ensuring the prevention of food poisoning incidents, particularly those involving E. coli. Mr Rampton asked Mark Davis for his comments. How good, looking back, and it was a standard of hygiene and food handling in the Colchester restaurant in your time? It was excellent. The defendant's witnesses make a number of allegations about that. One which may be important I'd like to deal with is that raw meat was often served to customers. Would you like to comment on that? To my knowledge, raw meat was never knowingly served to customers. Do you think that might have been brought to your attention if it had happened with any regularity? The customers would certainly bring it to my attention. But Sia Makalimi, who worked for McDonald's from 1985 to 1987 and is now a university technician in information technology, also claimed that uncooked burgers were sold to customers. If we go to the statement of Mr Davis, in paragraph 10 he says, you allege raw meat would be sold. Did you say that? Yes, raw meat in the middle, not absolutely raw, in the middle of the quarter pounder. He then says, I'm sure I would have known of it, customers would have complained. Do you have anything to say about that? They did complain to the shift manager. Did they complain to you, the customers? No, they would not complain to me, no. But you saw them complain to others? Yes, I did. But there was a further allegation from Simon Gibney. You refer in your statement to blocked drains. There was a specific problem at the Colchester store in that the filtering machine had broken, so that the oil fries had to be emptied much more often because they were unable to be filtered. This caused the drains to block. And I can remember on at least two occasions, sewage coming up through the floor vents in the kitchen and being mopped out of the way while we were working. On one occasion, it was actually two inches deep. And we had got bun trays, which are about four inches high, turned them upside down and stood on those in the kitchen area so the store could stay open. You were standing on these trays on top of the sewage. What were you doing on these trays? Cooking people at the grill, people on the toasters, and people putting condiments into the burgers. They would all be standing on them. Mark Davis had an answer to this allegation as well. Do you remember anything about sewage in the premises of Colchester? Not sewage as such, but I do remember the drains backing up on one occasion. The toilet sewage went down through a pipe and came out at the back of the restaurant. And also from the kitchen, there was a separate drainage system whereby water went down through the grease trap and met up with the pipe down from the toilet. On the occasion I remember it backing up out into the kitchen, the drains blocked at the grease trap bit, so it was more greasy water rather than sewage on that particular occasion. What did you do about it? First of all, it only came out just slightly in the back room, which is away from the food preparation area, so we just tried to mop it up and called Dynarod out to clean the drains. It fairly quickly became more widespread than that. As soon as it entered anywhere near the food prep area, we shut the restaurant. For how long? For approximately two hours. Was that the only occasion when anything like that happened? It's the only time I remember in all the time I was there. But this explanation was contradicted by a statement from Mrs. Catherine Harrison, a McDonald's crew member from 1983 to 1989. 
There were frequent problems with the filtering machine at Colchester. No one seemed to bother about getting a new one. Fat would be poured down the sink or drain. I remember occasions when this led to sewage in the kitchen area. I remember a couple of occasions when people mopped up sewage in the kitchen area whilst cooking and food preparation carried on. The store was not closed. Are you happy for that to be taken as your evidence? Yes. Mr. Rampton accused C.M. Akalimi of malice and of masterminding the recruitment of witnesses to give evidence against McDonald's. When did you hear about the Transnational's publication Working for Big Mac? About a couple of months after I left, I would say. You went straight to them and said, I think I can help you. I've got some dirt to spill about McDonald's. No, not at all. I was interested in telling the truth to an organisation which seemed to be doing research about what was going on behind the scenes at McDonald's. You didn't like the way McDonald's worked because you found being asked to do cleaning jobs, things like that, you found that degrading, didn't you? I find any job which is in your job description reasonable to do. I would not say it was degrading. Do you remember phoning Simon Gibney shortly after you left McDonald's? No. You don't? I have not been in touch with Simon since I left McDonald's. There are, as you probably know, a number of people from that particular period that have signed statements of the defendants in this case. Yes. Was it you who got those together? No, I have not seen any of them since. The evidence concerning the Colchester branch moved into another gear with the appearance of Ray Coton. Now a savings investment advisor with the TSB, he'd trained as an assistant manager Jones, under Mark Davis taken. at Colchester. Coton supported the allegations of earlier defence witnesses, but he also claimed that Davis encouraged him to pay staff for fewer hours than they worked. You said you were taught to dock people's money so they did not get paid for all the hours they worked by altering their clock cards. You were taught to do this as an assistant manager by Mark Davis. That's correct, yes. To make sure I understand exactly what's being alleged about um, hours being docked off time and <coughs> clock cards being altered, just exactly what was done. Can you tell me that? In my time as an assistant manager, the hourly paid workers were actually paid on a manual clocking in card. So yes, that... take it slowly. Well, they have to come in, punch the clock card, clock out for their breaks, clock back in again, and clock out at the end of the day. It was then a manual job for the manager or assistant manager at the end of each day to physically add up with a calculator the number of hours worked minus the unpaid breaks and then just write a total hour figure on the clock card. What the practice was, if someone had actually done 42 hours, you would write down 41 or 40. Or 40, yes. And then what happened? Well, what happened what, is... Uh, what about the, uh, the clock cards? Were they altered in any way? Just the end totals will be altered. Not an entry on the clock card? No. These practices were going on, were they, when the Colchester store was chosen as store of the year? That would have been happening then, yes. Also, the food watering down practices. That would have been happening then, yes. Mark Davis was promoted to area supervisor after Colchester won the Store of the Year award. Ray Coton took over as manager. But when well, cross-examined by Mr. Rampton, he claimed he was constantly at the end of criticism correct. from Davis. Are you saying this leads to an inevitable pressure to cut corners in order to achieve your target? There was always pressure. The pressure never ever stopped the whole time I worked for the company. Constantly, if he did well in one area, it would be, well done, but what about... It never stopped. It's deeply ingrained in the whole company, the whole way it works. If you were right, Mr. Curtin, every manager in the country at McDonald's would be driven to cut the same corners that you cut, wouldn't they? I would be very surprised if it didn't happen in other stores. I was only working in one store, so I can only comment on my particular situation. But it does seem that the only people that are saying wonderful things are the ones that are still working. And the ones that have left are saying something's gone wrong. So there must be some truth in it there, surely. Mark Davis was then recalled to the witness box to confirm his statement refuting the allegations made by Ray Coton. Mr Davis, is that the statement you made recently in relation to allegations made by Mr Ray Coton in this court? Yes, it is. Were you here in court most of the time when Mr Coton was giving evidence? Yes, I was. Are the contents of that statement true? Yes, they are. Thank you very much. You carried out most of the training of Ray Coton, didn't you? Yes, I did. And that included training in watering down products and in docking hours in order to save labour costs? It certainly did not. 
The main thrust of the defendant's case is, in effect, that this was endemic in Colchester because of the pressure to meet targets. Then what I have to ask myself is, was Colchester a rogue store in this respect, either because Mr Coton is a rogue manager and or because Mr Coton and Mr Davis are rogue managers? And then there was the evidence which emerged during the cross-examination of Sid Nicholson about the rap session in the film One Every Mile. Six hours. I think, as you know, they paid you for 60 hours. Yes. So Just I think we should get some other more competent to do the job. I paid, I paid the last premium last week, mm -hmm. last two weeks, and then he only gave me one hour instead of about six or eight. You said the subject matter and comments were typical. What about complaints about hours' work being under-recorded? I have... Had you heard that many times before? No, I wouldn't be concerned if that came up in a rap session and have inquiries made. I must say, however, I lost quite a lot of that conversation. The sound wasn't too good to me. Someone said they'd been docked six hours or something. Oh, no, it was much more than that. Someone went as far as saying that they'd worked six or eight hours over time and had only been paid for an hour. That is totally unacceptable. If that came up in a rap session, I'd have inquiries made immediately. No detailed evidence was heard as to whether or not inquiries were made about the allegations in that rap session. And in reaching his judgment, Mr Justice Bell will have to consider whether MacDonald's supervision of labour practices is subject only to occasional aberrations or whether these lapses were far more widespread, the inevitable result of the company's system of operation. When we return, the rainforests of Brazil and the trial goes worldwide on the internet. On Friday, February the 16th, 1996, a website was launched on the internet by supporters of the defendants. The website, called McSpotlight, provided instant access to witness statements and clips of programmes critical of McDonald's, as well as allowing anyone throughout the world to download copies of the fact sheet at the centre of the trial. The McSpotlight website later claimed it was accessed 174,000 times during its first week. When the court reassembled the following Monday, Mr. Rampton was irritated. He believed the defendants had been drumming up publicity for McSpotlight when they should have been working on documents he'd sent to them. Well, I should say I find it quite extraordinary that Mr. Morris and Miss Steele haven't got themselves together for this morning. The reason why they couldn't consider this matter last Friday was that they were, what shall I say, conducting some kind of media entertainment. Um, I want to object to that now. If Mr. Rampton has any kind of proof... When this latest skirmish in court was over, the next topic in the trial dealt with claims in the London Greenpeace leaflet that McDonald's were responsible for environmental damage, including the destruction of rainforests in Costa Rica and Brazil. Uh, can you turn over the page, please, uh, and pass your eye down to the blob and the heading, Why is it wrong for McDonald's to destroy rainforests? So far as you know, do McDonald's destroy rainforests? We do not. Does McDonald's in the United Kingdom, or does it not, have a concern for the environment? It most certainly does. It is born not only of being McDonald's and our concern, but I'm a parent too. We talked about my two daughters some time ago. Does it matter to you whether there are any rainforests left by the time you're dead and your children have grown up? Of course it does. I'm sure it will matter to them and my grandchildren. Hopefully I'll get a few one of these days. It's everybody's concern. Does the company now have a policy on rainforests, a written policy? We do, yes, sir. McDonald's corporate policy of not purchasing beef from former rainforest areas had relevance to one of the film clips now freely available on the McSpotlight website. This was part of a Channel 4 programme broadcast in 1989 called Jungle Burger, a documentary which claimed that McDonald's restaurants in America used beef from rainforest areas in Costa Rica. As a result of legal action taken by McDonald's, who cited their policy of not using beef from deforested areas, Channel 4 apologised in court and agreed to pay McDonald's costs. But Helen Steele and Dave Morris relied on the same film, which was screened in court, for evidence to support their case that beef from Costa Rican rainforest areas was exported to the USA. This interview, also available on McSpotlight, was with Sergio Quintana, marketing director of Co-op Montesios. Yes, uh, because the type of meat that we produce has to comply with all the technical specifications that they need in the U.S. And which fast food chains are you supplying by that way? Which ones? We are supplying McDonald's and... and 
Sergio Quintana did not give evidence, but he swore a witness statement claiming that the interview with him had been edited to give a false impression that he exported beef to McDonald's in the United States. This was denied by the director of the film. I'm going to go through what I would call lies put out by McDonald's or McDonald's UK and see what you think. Are you aware McDonald's has used beef supplies in some countries, for example Costa Rica, on land that was formerly rainforest? Well, I'm going to intervene now, partly because Mr Morris has started playing to the gallery. He cannot put a question like that since there's not a fair record to sustain what he has said. It's in dispute as to whether it was formerly rainforest or not. No, it's been admitted. It's been admitted. The only question is, how long ago? It's in dispute as to which parts ever were rainforest and if they were, when they were. Manuel Jimenez's statement of McDonald's Costa Rica says, the cattle slaughtered to supply the company come from ranches in regions which were deforested in the 1950s and early 1960s. And, to the very best of my knowledge, this has always been the case. So, when McDonald's Costa Rica opened up in 1970, they were using supplies, some of which came from land cleared less than 10 years earlier. Do you agree with that? No. He's talking about the early 1970s. That could be 20 years earlier. Or it could be 10 years earlier. It could be. The McDonald's corporate policy statement also reads, it is McDonald's policy to use only locally produced and processed beef in every country where we have restaurants. But the defendants stumbled across evidence that appeared to contravene this policy in documents that McDonald's had given them by mistake. The documents showed that in 1983, McKee Food Services, who supply hamburgers to McDonald's in the UK, had on one occasion negotiated the import of 83 metric tons of meat from a company in Brazil, owned by the British meat magnate Lord Vesti. This was the only evidence of beef being imported from Brazil to Britain, but Dave Morris pursued the matter further with Edward Oakley, the senior vice president of McDonald's UK, first asking him about a letter sent from McDonald's in reply to a query from a customer in 1982. No, I do not recollect that figure. And the second paragraph says, McDonald's has a long-standing policy of buying all our products from the suppliers in the host country where we are doing business. Well, this is around the time, roughly, of the Brazilian beef shipment, isn't it? So, it does seem to be that the Brazilian beef shipment was a transgression of that policy. No, I think when this person is talking about the finished products that are supplied to McDonald's restaurants, She's not talking about raw ingredients. It then says, As a result, we can assure you that the only Brazilian beef used by McDonald's is that purchased by the six stores located in Brazil itself. So what do we make of all that then? What's the question? Why not just ask, uh, in, in the light of that letter, was the purchase of Brazilian beef in breach of McDonald's policy? That's your question? Yes. No, it wasn't. We still bought the hamburgers locally. We didn't buy the ingredients locally, we bought the hamburgers locally. In the spring of 1996, halfway through the evidence concerning environmental issues in Central and South America, there was a dramatic turn of events in court, sparked off by another application from McDonald's to change their libel claim. The original claim had been that the defendants were liable for publication of the leaflet because they'd handed out copies of it on specific dates. Now, on day 228, almost two years into the trial, Mr Rampton told the judge that McDonald's wished to change their claim and hold the defendants liable for publication on a far wider scale. To clarify the reasons for this application, Mr Rampton fell back on the native tongue of the legal profession, Latin. It's one of those cases where the old tag qui facit per, in this case it would be alio facit per se, is peculiarly apt to the facts of this case. Well, I, I don't Can want... Can Mr. Rampton... Oh, sorry. Um, what it means is, who does things through others, does them himself. Different actual dates have been given for the defendant's personal acts of distribution, which now, if we were given leave, is a subsidiary consideration. And if we should prove the case, it will wither away to nothing because they would be liable for all publication to the leaflet within the jurisdiction up to the date of the writ. 
I don't know if I've said anything funny. Maybe Mr. Morris is making the jokes and not me. Everyone should stay calm and respectful to the other side. Because I'm not going to be affected by one side or the other. A good case will always upset the other side. It may indeed contrive a different result from that which would have been achieved on the old pleadings. The next day, Helen Steele complained to the judge that he'd given them insufficient time to prepare an argument against MacDonald's proposed change of pleading. Please, can I point out something? We're in court today. We're in court on Tuesday. We're in court on Wednesday, and I work at the weekends. And it's going to be extremely difficult for me to do any kind of serious preparation for a complex legal argument on an extremely fundamental issue before the 13th. I'm going to adhere to what I've said, and I do not want any further discussion of it. You'll be ready to start on the afternoon of Wednesday the 13th. Can I just say something? We're extremely stressed by this case. We've got a massive amount of work and there are only such limits we can go to. I don't think that sufficient consideration is being given to the amount of work we have to do, the time we have to do it, and the amount of stress we're under. I don't know, I just, I just don't think it's fair. I have to form my independent judgment on this, and in respect of this matter, I think you can. Do you want us to have nervous breakdowns? It's just ridiculous. No, I don't want that, but I'm not going to be swerved from what I think is right. Helen Steele left the court soon after this and for the remainder of the day took no further part in the proceedings. The trial continued without Helen Steele for three days, after which she returned to court armed with a letter from her doctor, the same doctor who had written to the court previously about her health. I'll hand up a copy of the letter with just solely the name and address of the doctor blanked out. I'll hand a copy to the plaintiffs as well. I don't have anything to hide. It's purely for personal reasons of privacy. As Mr. Justice Bell read the letter from Miss Steele's doctor, he recalled what had been written in the earlier letter from her doctor, read out in court the previous year. There's no harm in my reading out parts of this, is there, Miss Steele? Of this letter, no. no. Uh, the doctor refers to various um, stress-related illnesses, and there was a, a phrase I know was used last time. Uh, the doctor doesn't use the phrase, uh, which I hope I've remembered correctly which you didn't want read out in court and which you joined issue with anyway. <clears throat> Do you have any objection to me saying what the phrase was that was omitted last time? Yes. You really ought to help yourself, you know. I do, because I don't agree with it. Well, you virtually tie my hands behind my back so I can't do anything to help you. But that's not fair. Last year you said it didn't add anything. To me, it doesn't add to anything. I mean, it must be apparent to everyone I'm suffering from stress. I don't normally carry on like this. I mean, it's not fair. I mean, how can anybody know what they're seeing with their own eyes? I'm not prepared just to accept declarations in court when the litigant in person is in an emotional state. It's in the letter! In the event the situation was resolved by Mr Justice Bell ruling there should be a two-week break in the hearings, not on grounds of health, but on the grounds that the defendants were not sufficiently prepared to continue with the hearing at that stage. And Mr Justice Bell also resolved the issue of publication by ruling that McDonald's could amend their pleading and hold the defendants liable for any and every publication of the leaflet. Then after the two-week break, Helen Steele and Dave Morris returned to court to focus on Brazil, the court first had to consider a rather basic question. What is a rainforest? When Ray Cheska, McDonald's director of world purchasing, was giving evidence, Mr. Rampton asked him for his definition of rainforest. Well, besides its uh, pristine beauty, uh, breathtaking in many respects, it's characterized by tall, slender trees. I was going to say it looks like myself. When you leave the rainforest and move into a dense forest, and it's no longer a life-sustaining forest. Now, a life-sustaining forest is what is a rainforest. It creates its own cloud, its own rain, does not need us. But then you get the um, dense forest, which is uh, starting a transition 
towards a dry forest, and then finally a dry forest into a savanna or a prairie and so forth, as you keep going south. But when George Monbiot, a zoologist who has specialized in the study of environmental issues in Brazil, gave evidence for the defendants, he claimed that Mr. Cheska's definition was incorrect. People perceive rainforests as the belt of woody vegetation going round the tropics, and that is how people talk about rainforest. Uh, it covers uh, all matters of different habitats and types. Um, if you were to take just about anyone from Britain and drop them by helicopter in one of those places and say, what are you in, they would say, I'm in the rainforest. Mr Justice Bell later seemed to indicate the way he was approaching the definition of rainforest. When a witness is in the witness box, what they cannot do is give evidence of what an ordinary reader of the leaflet would take rainforest to mean. It's an ordinary English word. As a matter of interest, it appears in the concise Oxford Dictionary, described in ordinary English words. The concise Oxford Dictionary definition of rainforest is, in fact, luxuriant tropical forest with heavy rainfall. And if Mr Justice Bell sticks to that definition, he'll certainly exclude any consideration of the destruction of dry tropical forests, as he considers his judgment. And he'll have another knotty problem to consider at the same time. Must the defendants identify the exact location of the rainforest areas that McDonald's are alleged to be directly responsible for having destroyed in order to raise cattle? This is what Mr Rampton said they must do, and he was dismissive of their written submissions against this. Let me take, if I may, the first two lines. Brazilian beef, some originated from cattle raised on ex-forest land, blah, 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 has been supplied by McDonald's. The defendants don't seem to realise what a gigantic country Brazil is. Mato Grosso and Goiás, which parts of Mato Grosso and Goiás? How close are they to ex rainforest land? How do they become ex rainforest land? And so on and so forth. No, I, I'm not so sure, you see, because it's put on the general basis of the, of the knock-on effect. Yes, but my you know, what Mr Morris is saying is, you, it doesn't matter if you're some way away from the rainforest. It has a, a knock-on effect down the line. Now, at the end of the day, I may or, or may not think much of that, but is it not at least arguable? It's arguable in the sense that it's an interesting general proposition. But, my love, this is supposed to be a defence to an action by McDonald's. It's not supposed to be a seminar on environmental studies. I do notice, for all their claims to be environmentalists, how remarkably ignorant the defendants seem to be on the subject, but there it is. I object strongly to that. My love... The Bar Council prohibits insulting remarks by members of the bar against other parties. He was quite right. I withdraw it and apologise. Malad, that being so, yes, of course, it's an interesting topic of conversation. But one has to look at what the actual material is that is available to refine that interesting general discussion into a case against McDonald's. Dave Morris tried to establish that case against McDonald's when cross-examining Ray Cheska, who held that none of the places where McDonald's obtained their cattle were areas he regarded as rainforest. You see Baja de Gassas on the border of Goya State and Mato Grosso, yes? Where there's a meatpacking plant, yes? Yes. The area north of there. Do you know of the large-scale indigenous population and there have been land disputes with the cattle ranching industry in that area? Oh, what's this got to do with not since I've been involved, no. Mr. Rampton said, what's it got to do with McDonald's? Nova Javantina, which is in that area, is a region that supplies McDonald's. Do you know that area includes tropical moist forest areas as well? Where are you now? North of Baja de Gases. What I know, this is not tropical forest, tropical wet forest, this area. You've been it's... there, have you? Well, I've been at that plant, yes, here in, uh, I've been in Baradu... I can't even read it on my map. Dugasas. Yes, yes, Dugasas. But you haven't been to Nova Javantina, have you? No. But we have a witness who says she has. OK. Susan Branford has studied conditions in Brazil, both as an academic and as a journalist, for the past 30 years. She'd just returned from the Amazon when she entered the witness box to give evidence for the defendants. She told the court that over the years she'd often travelled through Brazilian areas where cattle ranching had caused deforestation, including the states of Acre, Goiás and Mato Grosso. The northern part of Mato Grosso was the area where Nova Chavantina was located. The area around Nova Chavantina. Have you seen 
forestry clearance in that area? Yes, I know this region particularly well. Between 1975 and 1983 to 4, I saw this region changing. When I first went, it was a long and quite arduous journey through, again, what I call tropical forest, which is humid tropical forest. Across the years, I saw cattle ranches being set up in this region and forests being cut down to pave the way for pasture. Just pause a moment, please. <clears throat> Can I continue? Hmm? The term Nova Javantina actually comes from the Javante Indians. The Javante Indians were moved out to pave the way for cattle ranches. Some were actually taken out by plane. It was a very wild, rough area. I saw on a crossroad somebody being killed on one of these trips. It was real far west. A lot of conflict going on between cattle companies and peasant farmers. It was one of the most violent regions I knew. Nova Chaventino was one of the places where Braslow, the sole supplier of hamburgers to McDonald's in Brazil, had obtained some of their beef. But McDonald's argued that this area was not true rainforest. The state of Acre, even further to the west, was without doubt true rainforest country. So did Braslow also get beef for McDonald's from Acre? One of the most active companies was the meat packing group Bordon. We personally saw forests being cut down by Bourdon employees and gathered evidence from peasant families that they'd been forcibly evicted from their plots by Bourdon employees. When you say <coughs> cattle have on occasions been brought down by truck from Acre, have you seen that process? Yes, I have seen trucks coming down that road. You frequently see them with Bourdon written on the sides of trucks coming down south from Acre. And it is general knowledge that they're on the way to Campo Grande, which is the nearest slaughterhouse that Bourdon have in that region. During his cross-examination by Dave Morris, Ray Cheska confirmed that Bourdon delivered cattle to the plant at Campo Grande where McDonald's suppliers, Braslow, obtained some of their beef. But it's McDonald's case that due to prohibitive costs and practicalities, it's implausible that any cattle from recently cleared rainforest areas have been transported over long distances. McDonald's maintained that the evidence for any beef from rainforest areas ending up as beef for their burgers is so slim that it's virtually non-existent, and that they've always had a policy not to use beef from rainforest areas. The defendant's case is that the evidence they've produced in court is just the tip of an iceberg, that McDonald's rainforest policy has only existed since 1989, and in any case has been ineffectual. It's Mr Justice Bell's task to decide who is right and who is wrong. When we return, how McDonald's hired private detectives to infiltrate London Greenpeace. Mr Justice Bell had decided to leave the most crucial question of all until the very end of the trial, whether Helen Steele and Dave Morris could in fact be held in any way responsible for the publication and distribution of the What's Wrong with McDonald's leaflet. As the trial began to build to a bitter climax, Mr Rampton wanted Mr Justice Bell to take into account a separate London Greenpeace publication, which set out the background and aims of the group. Uh, this is something I read out to you in opening. Um, I'm on the second page, under the heading Campaigning. Yes, I see. Perhaps the most successful campaign we have initiated in recent years has been the one against the McDonald's Hamburger Corporation. This has become a nationwide and worldwide movement, uniting many disparate campaigners in the aim of smashing a multinational that epitomizes everything we despise, a junk culture, the deadly banality of capitalism. The same leaflet describes London Greenpeace as an anarchist group and was to figure prominently when Paul Preston was cross-examined by Helen Steele about why McDonald's decided to take legal action. It says in that document, we are going to smash McDonald's. This is a primary objective. In there is a statement about alignment with animal liberation and at the same time in the British company we had four or five bombing incidents. You read the leaflet, that's it, is it? I discussed with Sid Nicholson the need to attend these public meetings you spoke of in your documents. I told him people should be attending these meetings. And whatever these people do, whatever they can find out, should be conducted in a proper, legal, constructive manner. But I fully intended to stop further publication of this document. When Sid Nicholson gave evidence, he claimed that he, as well as McDonald's head of security, had seen Helen Steele distributing leaflets outside McDonald's head office in Finchley at a demonstration in October 1989. 
But Nicholson also hired two firms of inquiry agents to infiltrate London Greenpeace. And McDonald's relied upon the evidence of four agents from these firms to establish that Helen Steele and Dave Morris were among the key members responsible for the publication and distribution of the leaflet at the centre of the trial. Brian Bishop had infiltrated London Greenpeace, pretending to be interested in environmental issues, and attended many of the group's weekly meetings. Mr Rampton asked Mr Bishop about a meeting that took place on August the 9th, 1990. Uh, you say, I arrived at 1930 or as we say in English, 7.30 p.m. Present were Jonathan, Jane, Alan from Catford, Charlie and Mark. Unknown to Brian Bishop, Alan from Catford was in fact Alan Clare, one of the other investigators. And Clare, of course, had no idea that Bishop was also an undercover agent. So of the six people present at the meeting, four were London Greenpeace regulars and two were undercover agents. Then you say, this meeting lacked the direction of last week probably due to the absence of the leading members of the group. I had the impression that no one present wished to be definitive, because whatever they said would be overruled by the non-existent hierarchy if the latter disagreed. Then there's what I take to be a comment of your own. So much for anarchy. <laughs> yes, it was. Can I ask you, at this stage, 9th of August, 1990, can you remember who you perceive to be the leading members of the group, or as you ironically put it, the non-existent hierarchy? Paul Gravitt. Dave Morris and Helen Steele. In your statement, you talk about Mr. Morris, myself and Paul Gravitt being the most vociferous. That wasn't in your notes. Do you know where that came from? That would have been my general impression of the whole group. But we're talking about three years later, because it wasn't in your notes. And it wasn't until three years later that you made your statement. Yes, I agree. So what was the impression from? My impression from, in that case, my memories at the time of the occasion. Alan Steele also cross-examined a third private detective, Alan Pocklington, about his account of the role that she and Dave Morris played at London Greenpeace meetings. You've made a reference in your witness statement to it being clear from the meeting of November the 16th, 1989, that myself and Mr. Morris were core members. But that wasn't in your original notes of the meeting. And, in fact, Mr. Morris wasn't even there. So it couldn't have been clear to you during this meeting? It says during the course of this and other meetings. Yeah, and this. I.e. it was clear during this meeting and other meetings. Well, that's not, that's not the way I read it. It doesn't say that. It says during the course of this and other meetings. The agents gave evidence for two weeks, and the court heard how one of them broke into the London Greenpeace offices to take photographs. How letters were, as another agent described it, purloined to provide evidence. How a third agent, known only as Shelley, who didn't give evidence at the trial, had begun a relationship with one of the group members. And how other members were followed home after meetings to find their home addresses for the delivery of the writs for this action. Because in September 1990, Morris and Steele weren't the only ones to be handed writs for libel. Five members of London Greenpeace were originally sued by McDonald's, but three of them backed down and apologised in court and withdrew all the allegations made in the leaflet. One of those named in the writ who apologised was the next witness to give evidence on behalf of the defendants, Paul Gravett. Helen Steele read his statement into court and asked him to confirm his account of the demonstration in October 1989 when both Sid Nicholson and McDonald's head of security claimed to have seen her handing out leaflets. You say... I was on the picket at McDonald's headquarters on 16th of October 1989 and I do not think any fact sheets were taken or handed out on that day. Also, I don't remember Helen handing out any leaflets at all. Yeah. Helen Steele then asked Paul Gravett about the private investigator's note of the meeting on January the 18th, 1990. She admitted to helping with all anti-McDonald's information leaflets and their distribution. Have you ever heard me say anything like that? No. I mean, you didn't... Helen didn't start coming to London Greenpeace regularly until 1988. Well, that was nearly two years after the fact sheet was published, so there's no way you'd have said that. No. He's made that up. Dave Morris asked Paul Gravett about the private investigator's notes of the London Greenpeace meeting of March the 1st. On the top half of the page it says, helped organise the 1989 McDonald's Fair. Have you got any comments on that? Well, that's complete rubbish. You didn't. Because I know. Because I did. And help produce the leaflets for the anti-McDonald's campaign. Great involvement. Completely wrong. You weren't greatly involved. You weren't involved at all, in fact. 
Then the last thing I want to look at is the 20th of September 1990, Brian Bishop, I think, about people organising a picket of Kentucky Fried Chicken on Seven Sisters Road, and Dave Morris stated he was getting too old for that kind of thing. You were the elder statesman of the group. Yes, this is the last question. Mr Gravitt, you got a writ from McDonald's. You were one of the people who originally got a writ from McDonald's. And in 1991, an apology was entered on your behalf for the criticisms made in the London Greenpeace fact sheet. Yeah. Why did you make that apology? I made the apology because at the time we were given advice that we could not get legal aid. And without barristers, it was unthinkable to fight a libel case on our own. If we lost the case, we'd be bankrupted. Well, that's what we were told, so that's why I apologised. I didn't apologise because I thought the leaflet was lies. And what was your view about the leaflet at the time? Well, my view of the leaflet was, as it is now, that I'd stand by it, you know? I think it's accurate. During cross-examination, Mr Rampton asked about the role that Dave Morris played in London Greenpeace. Dave Morris was already a member by the time you joined. Well, it was part of the group when I joined, yeah. But as I became a more regular attender, I noticed his attendance got less. That was from 87 onwards. You described him this morning as some kind of elder statesman, didn't you? Off-the-cuff witticism. Mr Gravitt, off-the-cuff is sometimes more reliable than under the sleeve. Elder statesman's quite a good description, isn't it? Dave used to come along to the meetings and talk about the history of the group and what he'd done in the past. Now, I've never denied that McDonald's was one of the campaigns of London Greenpeace, but, you know, it was one of the campaigns. And certain individuals took part in it and others didn't. And Miss Steele and Mr. Morris didn't. No, Mr. Gravitt. No. Am I to... Uh, <coughs> am I to understand that answer? You're saying that Miss Steele and Mr. Morris didn't take part in the anti-McDonald's campaign. Or have I misunderstood you? Well, by any part, they were not, as I can remember, involved in organising. I mean, it was only coming to meetings, really. Now, Helen did take part in the anti-McDonald's campaign in 1989, so if you want to say include that as part of the campaign, yeah. But, I mean, no way was this a group effort. My involvement in it was on a totally different level to anyone else's in the group. I was the anti-McDonald's campaign. How many people attended the picket on the 16th of October, 1989? Don't remember accurately. 25? Something like that. So you weren't on your own, were you? No. When the final witness for the defendants, Jane Laporte, gave evidence, Mr Rampton asked some personal questions about Helen Steele, which would set the stage for his later cross-examination of her in the witness box. Do you agree with me that you will often get in a temper when she's at the losing end of a decision or an argument? I can't actually recall if I've ever seen Helen in a temper. Not with me. You know, I don't think I've seen her in a temper as it were with anyone else. Do you agree with me that she has a somewhat sharp tongue and a way of putting people down? No. You don't? No. You do not then agree that she is a forceful and somewhat intimidating character? No. I don't find her intimidating. Mr Rampton had now made it clear in court how he regarded his opponent, Helen Steele. When we return the shootout between the barrister and the barmaid, and Mr Big Mac faces his final grilling. On Monday, July the 8th, 1996, day 275 of the trial, Helen Steele finally entered the witness box. And when she did so, since the defendants had no barristers acting for them, it was to give evidence alone and on her own behalf. I solemnly, sincerely and truly declare and affirm that the evidence which I shall give shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. I'll start with my statement made on the 12th of July, 1993. Since about 1982, I've been involved in various activities and campaigns to change society so that people and animals and the planet we live on are not seen just as the means for a majority to make their profits. Is it OK if I sit down? Yes, uh, do keep your voice up when you're reading. Don't go so fast. Right. Helen Steele then dealt with the allegation that she'd handed out copies of the fact sheet on the 1989 Worldwide Food Day. On the 16th of October, 1989, I attended a picket of McDonald's head office in Finchley. I do not remember handing out any leaflets on this picket. 
Three years after the event, I didn't want to categorically 100% say that I couldn't have handed out a single copy of the fact sheet. It's my firm belief that I didn't hand out a single copy of the fact sheet, but three years after the event, it's impossible for me to say. Um, there were some comments put to Miss Laporte about my character the other day. If I've been somewhat short-fused on occasions, then I wouldn't like it to be indicative of how I am normally. Under cross-examination by Mr Rampton, Helen Steele agreed that she'd attended 33 London Greenpeace meetings between October 1989 and September 1990. Mr Rampton suggested McDonald's was discussed at 23 of these meetings, but Helen Steele said those discussions were of minor significance. Mr Rampton then asked Ms Steele about the London Greenpeace Aims and Ideals leaflet. Taking action is vital, because in the end, deeds, not words, really matter. That's why we support groups such as the Animal Liberation Front who break the law. Am I right that two members of your own group were charged in relation to an incendiary device at a Debenham store at Luton, not including you? I don't see the relevance. Well, the relevance, Mr. Do you want to ask me whether or not I personally support non-violent direct action? The answer is yes. Including burning down a store at the cost of 11 million pounds? Or was it eight million? I don't support any activity which would harm members of the public or anybody else. Do you remember an eight-minute video that you and Mr Morris made sometime? We did not make it. We were filmed. You were featured in it, shall I say that? We were filmed. You remember towards the end of the tape, there was a shot of Mr Morris addressing the crowd through a megaphone. There may be. You got the photograph album there? Yes. You look at the first photograph. Yes. There are several placards with the words fight, censorship, smash McDonald's, aren't there? Yes. Then turn over the page, please. This is a slightly different message saying, uh, save the forest, smash McDonald's, is that right? Yes. Now there you are at the head of the procession. It's a protest march, presumably, against the proceedings in this case, wasn't it? It was a protest march against McDonald's and their attempts to silence their critics. Do you dissociate yourself with sentiment smash McDonald's? I would like to see a world without multinationals and that includes McDonald's. So the London Greenpeace anti-McDonald's campaign, which was being heralded as a huge success even by the time you joined it, must have seemed like manna from heaven to you. It was a campaign I was involved in. I mean, I've attended hundreds of demonstrations and pickets on a wide range of issues, and McDonald's happened to be one of those. You must have thought the fact sheet, so-called fact sheet, was one of the best things you'd ever read, am I right? It was interesting. Yes. And I'm sure you embraced it with enthusiasm, didn't you? I don't know what you mean, to be quite honest. Are you saying, Miss Steele, that it's in character for you to sit by when something is being done in the name of a group with which you are associated, of which you do not approve? Is that part of the steel makeup? If it had been something obnoxious or offensive, then I probably would have said something. But when I read the fact sheet, it all seemed to be stuff that I'd heard before, so there wouldn't have been any reason for me to say anything about it. The impression you've been trying to give, we've all seen how you've reacted to the progress of this trial, and I'm certainly not going to rehearse in open Mr. court. Mr Rampton is giving evidence. He should ask specific questions about it, because I could give evidence about that about the incredible patience he's shown over the past five years. You're not giving evidence either. Well, as far as I'm concerned, Mr Rampton, sitting throughout this trial has taken a great deal of patience. Bearing in mind the obnoxious comments that you've made throughout it, the provocative remarks, the grunts and groans and rude remarks and what have you, I think, in fact, both of us have been extremely patient. And was that why you turned the air blue, was it? When you lost your transcripts appeal in the Court of Appeal? Turned the air blue. F words and C words by the string. It's rubbish. That's not true. No, that's not true. Do you remember attending a hearing when you were ordered to give particulars of your rainforest case within seven days or else you would be struck out? Do you no. remember that? No. Do you remember the hearing was attended on the plaintiff's behalf by Mrs Brindley Codd? No, I don't remember. So you don't remember after it was over, outside the court, Mr Morris shaking his fist in Mrs Brindley Codd's face and you standing on the touchline screaming in <laughs> collaborator? I don't know where you get your stories from, but they're just not true. 
I've never seen Mr. Morris shake his fist in anybody's face, least of all Mrs. Brindley Codd's, and I never shouted, you f***ing collaborator, at Mrs. Brindley Codd either. As far as myself is concerned, I don't believe I have a case to answer. Having heard all the publication witnesses, I would like to get some advice, but my inclination at the moment is that I don't need to go into the witness box, and I don't want to go into the witness box for that reason. Well, it's entirely a matter for you. The next day, Mr. Morris informed the judge that he had decided not to enter the witness box. But he'd overlooked one important legal problem. Earlier in the trial, Mr. Rampton had made a surprise disclosure. This is an affidavit sworn by Mr. Morris on the 31st of August, 1995. And that paragraph two of the affidavit reads, In 1990, McDonald's Corporation issued a libel writ against myself and a Ms. Steele, a separate party. This arose from leaflets we had produced. And of course, I emphasize the word we and the words had produced. Concerning inter alia the nutrition of McDonald's food, their employment practices and the effect of their operations on the environment. The affidavit was prepared for Mr. Morris in another court case concerning an unwaged centre in Haringey, which because of the McDonald's trial, Mr. Morris couldn't attend. Morris said that there was a mistake in the affidavit and that he had in fact sworn a second affidavit correcting produced to allegedly produced. However, since he hadn't entered the witness box, the judge ruled that he wouldn't be able to take the second affidavit into account when considering his judgment. Towards the end of the trial, Dave Morris tried to retrieve this situation. He knew that McDonald's could only win on all the other issues if they could first prove that he and Helen Steele had, in fact, published and distributed the What's Wrong with McDonald's leaflet. And if Mr. Justice Bell had decided to hear the publication evidence at the beginning rather than at the end of the trial, he might have avoided presiding over the longest trial in English legal history. Dave Morris now expressed solidarity with the judge, who, he speculated, might be feeling pressure to find in favour of McDonald's in order to justify the two years spent hearing all the other issues. About publication going to the end of the case, I remember you made a comment fairly early on in the trial about the absurdity, if publication was not proven, about it being heard at the end. I think what's important is that we both feel that you shouldn't be under any pressure not to find for us on publication because it does seem the whole trial has been absurd if we win on publication. Yes, sir. I don't see myself succumbing to the pressure. It's a perfectly valid point for you to make. Right. I was trying to be as diplomatic as possible. The one issue we haven't dealt with so far is the question of the defendant's counterclaim, in which they were also suing McDonald's for issuing 3,000 leaflets as well as press releases labelling them as liars. It was Paul Preston, Mr Big Mac, who had initiated the case against Steele and Morris and who had authorised the McDonald's pamphlet which accused them of telling lies about McDonald's. And it was Mr. Big Mac who had to face his final grilling by the two defendants. First, Dave Morris, who started by asking him to look at a McDonald's press release. If you can look at that third blob, if you like. The leaflet in question contains many lies about McDonald's. Yes. And the word lies is repeated in the last word of the fifth blob. Yes. Dave Morris quoted seven instances in the McDonald's press release, which he said accused him and Helen Steele of distributing lies. Seeing as you authorised this press release attacking the credibility of myself and Ms Steele for distributing lies, can you name just one thing in that fact sheet we knew to be a lie, if in fact we did? I believe you knew the rainforest story to be untrue. I believe you know we do not exploit children and that we are not responsible for murder or McTorture or McRipoff. I believe the whole thing, if I read your aims and objectives document and look through further publication of material, the objective was to smash McDonald's at any cost regardless of the facts. Can you name just one sentence in that fact sheet I knew to be untrue? I believe you knew the whole thing. Do you ever wonder why groups campaign against McDonald's? No. You don't wonder? No. Why would I wonder about that? 
Do you ever stop to think that all these people who are campaigning against McDonald's believe that all the criticisms they are making of the company are true, and that is the reason why they want to expose what the company is doing? But it's not true. And that's why we are here in this court before this judge. The reason that people criticize McDonald's is because they believe the criticisms are true. I don't know if that's universally so or not. You'd accept that it could be so? It could be so. Right. And that it could be so in relation to myself and Mr. Morris? No. Not having read the aims and objectives of London Greenpeace. You've said in your statement that despite the fact that you've provided us with numerous documents and witness statements refuting, you say, the allegations in the fact sheet, that the defendants throughout the litigation have persistently reaffirmed the allegations in the leaflet. Do, do you just assume people are going to believe what you say as soon as you say it? No. You are aware that there are plenty of contrary statements in this case. That we've got 65, 70 witnesses on nutrition, experts on rainforests, experts on advertising, ex-employees who are all saying basically that the criticisms are justified. That's a matter for his lordship. He has to sort that one out. So there it was. 313 days. An extraordinary and unenviable marathon record for a libel trial. Did McDonald's come to regret they'd ever brought the case to court in the first place? Will the judgment be as weighty as the hearing was long? These questions must wait for answers until next month at the earliest. We hope you've enjoyed our attempt to compress 300 and more days into under three hours. Good night. Next on four, the Kirov Ballet, once the pride of the Soviet state, is now in crisis. Dancing for Dollars takes an intimate look at its glorious past and the recent scandal that has scarred its reputation. That's after the break. Channel 4.